Such a weird thing. Graham, you're back. I'm back. Oh, there we go. Nick, way better. All right. Watch. This is this is this is clean. This is clean. All right. All right. Jared has a question for okay, you. Okay. So yeah, look, continuing on, Graham. Mm -hmm. I want to know. So I, I, you know, I have, I got the opportunity to know Todd Monk and and play for him for a year. He is a pretty straightforward perfectionist, if you will. And he's not afraid to correct everything that's going on. Now, at the end of the day, I think we all can agree that we're going to watch a Georgia team win, lose, or draw go into the playoff situation. But we are still talking about 18- to 22-year-old kids. I do think it's going to be pretty hard to get them to lock in on the task at hand this week in practice. What are your feels about how their preparation is going to go this week with – the way things have gone and the way this thing is shaking out to what you're going to get in the SEC championship. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you talk about that perfectionist streak of, of within Todd Monk and, and you've kind of seen that the last couple of weeks, like Georgia's offensive line played a really bad game against Mississippi state. And then against Kentucky and Georgia tech, it's like, we're going to run the ball all day and we're going to challenge this group. And, you know, we want to see them look better. And they have, from a preparation standpoint, I mean, I, I think there is a motivation here for Georgia to go 15-0, and to win a conference championship, which they didn't do last year. Um, you know, Georgia hasn't won an SEC title since 2017. So I, I think there is a healthy motivation there. Um, I mean, like you said, right, like there's, there's always going to be the things that – occur around 18 to 22 year old kids there's there's only so much you can control as a staff but from what i've heard and, and just kind of talking to people close to the program uh the the guys who have been leaders on this team all year really want this they really want to kind of have that feather in their cap of going all the way through and winning the sec championship on the way to winning a national title and the group last year didn't do that so i think the Alabama game from last year, that loss is probably the best thing Georgia has going for it this week just because they still have that bad taste in their mouth. Obviously, Georgia is a uh, physical, hey, we're going to smash you in the mouth and you're not going to be able to gain a yard on us type of team, right? If you watched the LSU game last weekend, which I think a lot of people did, unfortunately, LSU got smashed in the mouth by a Texas A&M team that hasn't really done that all year, got run through. And offensively, they kind of, you know, they moved the ball a little bit, but had some self-inflicted wounds and stalled out, and the game kind of got away from them. For the LSU fans that are listening, what is the the avenue to pull off this upset and to, to upset Georgia basically in a home game for them? Like, how do they do that? What is the game plan? What is the recipe to pull off something like that? I think if you look at Georgia's defense this year, you know, really ever since that Missouri game, they haven't given up explosive runs. And I don't think LSU or probably anyone in the country, but I, I don't think LSU can come into this game and consistently get five, six yards a pop on the ground. But I think, you know, LSU needs to stay committed to the run game, uh, at least to a certain extent, and kind of just hope you have a bad fit somewhere in that that back seven from georgia and you can pop a big explosive run play um for all the hype that exists around keely ringo as a you know top draft prospect uh you go look last week georgia tech targeted him nine times now oh. he did a good job he gave up three catches he had three pass breakups but let's be honest like true number one corners aren't usually getting targeted nine yeah. times uh LSU has a very good receiving core, and they, they those guys have some size in a way that a lot of Georgia's opponents this year haven't. Um, Georgia's going to get up, and they're going to play, you know, press man with them, and they're, they're going to have two safeties sitting back there in cover two most of the time. But I think the avenue for, for LSU is really just hoping you win more of those, those battles on the sidelines than not and, and catching some 50 50 balls and then just kind of hoping for Georgia to, to make an uncharacteristic mistake or two. And I think the way to, to create that is, you know, putting pressure on them, putting some game stress on them that hasn't been there. But 
I yeah, I mean like Kamari Lassiter on the side opposite of Ringo has been really, really good this year. So I, I think if you're LSU, you want to pick uh kind of on Ringo's side and just hope that, you know, you get some PIs and you hit a long play or two and then you know try and work the slot with Javon Bullard. Um Malachi Starks, the the safety. He is a true freshman and he's, you know, a five-star kid. And like he started the year with a really impressive interception against Oregon. He's been very good in man coverage, but there have been some moments this year where, where teams have been able to kind of get him once, once in a game. Um, so I, I think that's kind of the hope for LSU is just playing on your receivers winning, you know, well, winning that's those not, 50-50 balls. That's not giving us enough. much. That's not giving us a lot of hope. <laughs> yeah. Hey, pray like for even, a pass interference. Doesn't sound like an even competition. Don't go after the other cornerback. Go after the for potential first rounder <laughs> and then just hope that you have some. <laughs> he might some grab pass. somebody. Yeah, hope, hope that a lucky, lucky charms we're, up your ass hey, right now. We're in a good well, spot. <laughs> Grant, let me Grant. ask you this. Let me ask you this. I mean, because I think, like, the, the thing that Georgia has been so good at this year is just – they're just a really good tackling football team. Right. And so, you know, it, it, I mean, Brian Kelly is a great offensive mind. Like there's a lot of good offensive minds on that staff. Um, but I, I mean, I do think you, you need like a superb game out of your offensive line. No like, doubt. I, I think you, you know, and you need some, some moments where, you know, your, your tight ends are getting downfield and they're cleaning up somebody on a block and maybe you hit a screen pass or something like that. But it's just no one has been able to just drive the the ball down the field on Georgia this year because, you know, if you throw a four-yard route, they're tackling you at four yards. They're not, you know, letting that turn into seven or eight. Right. And so, I mean, I think that's really the big thing is, like, Jaden Daniels has been a ton of fun to watch this year. He's been kind of up and down, but I just don't think he's the, the quarterback who is – super, super accurate to a level where he's going to hit that short route every single time and never get you behind the sticks. And once Georgia gets you behind the sticks, man, like it's trouble. So you, you talk about these uh, infinite this. advantages, right? We're also talking about <laughs> a de facto home game. I, I think for the average fan, a lot of people don't realize – you talk about them not winning a, a um, SEC championship last year. I don't think people realize that Alabama is about two and a half hours from where that SEC championship game is played. So it's really a split stadium. With the win being yeah. taken out of the sales of the LSU thing, how much of a home game are you really expecting this to kind of be for Georgia? I mean, I, I think just looking at the kind of aftermarket ticket sites, uh, there was, there's been a lot of tickets pop up since that LSU loss on Saturday night. Uh, so it, it seems like, you know, like prices for this game were really, really high. And then there's sort of been a flood of tickets over the last couple of days. I would assume most of those are coming from the LSU side, but there could be Georgia people as well that have right. become less interested in this matchup and maybe said, let me save my money for a playoff game. Hopefully we're coming back to Atlanta. You know, that's that's probably the mindset for some Georgia fans. But I would expect it to be a, a heavy Georgia crowd, maybe, you know, 70-30. But, like, LSU folks always travel well, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if there's more purple and gold in that stadium than, than a lot of people are expecting. Coming off the loss of which LSU just had to Texas A&M, what's – if you're obviously, I would say you're a fan of Georgia, you cover Georgia. What scares you if there's anything about LSU and what you have to defend? Obviously, I heard you, Georgia's defense is great. I feel like the offense has been a little bit anemic on Georgia's side for the last two weeks. It, I mean, it, it hasn't been great. And so if you're, if you know, if I mean, the point spread is 17, dog. If, if, like, what <laughs> makes you think that? I don't think it's going to be a blowout, it basically, is what I'm trying to say. And so. If there's not going to be a blowout, what what point do you get to? How does LSU pull off an upset? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Georgia's had a tendency to turn the ball over this year on offense, right? Like, I you know, I kind of talked a second ago about like Georgia's Georgia's defense. I think is the best unit in this game. That doesn't mean they can't be had. Uh, you know, I mean, they they let Missouri put up twenty something points on them this year, right? And like, I think. You know, generally speaking, for Georgia's defense this year, if things have gone a little bit awry, it has been a product of the offense having some turnovers. You know, Georgia's had 
three turnovers against Kent State in a quarter, like muff punts and, you know, fumbles and, and just weird stuff. Um, they, you know, they, they, they've cleaned that up a bit, but uh, Stetson Bennett does have a tendency to, you know, kind of have one one or two, like, YOLO plays a half where <laughs> he, he may be like – you know, he maybe feels himself a little too much, and we'll try and force the ball into double coverage. You get the, the new coverage. haircut. You get the new haircut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stequavius is the uh, <laughs> as, as they call him. Um, but I, I really, you know, I, I, I'm interested to get uh, your perspective, kind of playing for Todd Mocking. But like, you know, you brought up George's offense looking anemic the last couple of weeks, and I would agree. And I've I've been critical of them in some of my, you know, post game analysis, but you turn on the film and you're like, they're running, you know, a bunch of just really vanilla stuff. I mean, they're, you know, they're about a half zone scheme, half gap steam team in the run game. And for a lot of the year, the zone stuff wasn't working well the last few weeks it has been. Um, but I'm, I'm just curious what the route tree looks like for the wide receivers on Saturday. I really am just cause like, uh, they, they haven't really been asking those guys to go downfield much. And then, you know, that Georgia Tech game was a little weird and kind of tight and, and all, you know, Tech never really stopped Georgia, but Georgia had a lot of penalties and stuff that, like, killed drives and put them in bad situations. But all of a sudden in the third quarter of that game, it's like they tried Arian Smith out, who we've barely seen this year, and he's open in the back corner of the end zone from 50 yards away. And they, they throw an 80-yard wheel route to the running back. So it's like – it's kind of what I was talking about with Monken earlier. Like I, I feel like there's explosive plays that he kind of has like on file, but we haven't seen them for the last couple of weeks. And earlier this year, Georgia was much more of like this pass first offense where Bennett was attempting, you know, he was dropping back 35 to 40 times a game last couple of weeks. It's been more like 18 to 20. So I'm curious how they'll attack this LSU defense. Uh, just, you know, looking at what Texas A&M did last week, it, it felt like, you know, they had a lot of success running the ball. And I think that's fine, well, and good. But if you're Georgia, I do think they've had a tendency to almost get too conservative at times this year and rely a little too much on that defense or maybe be a little overconfident in that defense and kind of, you know, get up a couple possessions in a game and just get so one-dimensional that – you know, I mean, Kentucky had 10 guys in the box for like the entire fourth quarter and Georgia still never, never passed the ball. Um, so I, I think if you're a Georgia fan, you best. don't want to see that. So is that is that a lack of confidence in Stetson Bennett or is that just uh, their their mindset as a team right now? Like, hey, we're just not going to we're not going we to try to do anything crazy. We don't have to. I think I, I think there's maybe elements of each. Um I mean, Stetson's had a really good year. And, like, if you look at his interception line, there's about three of those that, you know, I mean, he's only had six picks, but at least half of them were were on wide receivers, like balls bouncing off hands that were well thrown and just kind of strange stuff. Um, I think, honestly, what happened is Georgia went to Mississippi State. They couldn't run the ball. And, you know, they, they came out in the third quarter and they threw the ball all over the place. And, and, you know, put that game away. But I think it freaks Kirby Smart out when he can't run the football and when, you know, he doesn't feel like his offense can go on a, a four-minute drive to end a game. And that Mississippi State game, they didn't look like that. And then the next two weeks, you just have these really run-heavy game plans where it's almost like they're, they're trying to kind of tweak and perfect what they're doing up front. And it feels like maybe there's honestly been like – a, a part of me that's wondered, do they kind of feel like they know what they have in Stetson and you have these two monster tight ends and you kind of know what your wide receiver core is this part of the year. And they've, they've done some rotations up front on the offensive line. Like they've just sort of played with that group a lot. So there, there's almost part of me that felt like we're playing opponents. We feel comfortable. We're going to beat and we want to make sure we have this run game dialed before we good, do Greg, go Greg, face Greg, It's called being good. That it happens when you have a <laughs> I, <football team. laughs> So my, my guess is I, I do think there is a ton of I, – I think, I think Todd has a lot of what you see in Jimbo in the sense of you know you're a good offense when you know what you're doing, the defense knows what you're doing, everyone in the stadium mm. knows what you're doing, and you still execute it. 
So I, I would say probably what you've seen over the last couple of weeks is him not really wanting to give up the explosive plays that are in there. I do think because I, I, I personally think he probably respects LSU knowing what this place is and knowing what it's been, that you'll see him open it up a little bit this game. I, I think you'll see that early, and I think late you'll see them attack what you just saw LSU give up on film recently. Yeah, because if LSU does what they did last week, uh, Stetson Bennett's going to throw the ball six times, and Georgia's going to run the ball for 450 <laughs> yards. But, and but, but, but what I, but what I personally it. think is you'll see them open up the game with yeah. some play-action yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Because having those right. guys already thinking that, hey, like they're, they're trying the to run, run it down yeah. our throat, yeah. play action stuff, get them deep, and then once this game kind of gets going and into the late second, not late second, depending on where they are, but like second half of the game, I think they're going to try to absolutely run the ball down the throat, bleed the clock out, win the ball game that way. But I do think you'll see them try to open it up early on. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that makes sense. And that kind of follows the pattern of, of what you've seen them do. I mean, against Tennessee, right? Like they came out in that first half and – they, they threw the ball a lot. They were very, very good at, at being, you know, unpredictable and, and switching up, run and pass. And the, the last couple of weeks, it's been, you know, run first down, run second down. Uh, if it's third and four or longer, we'll throw. If it's not, we're going to run again. It's just been super vanilla. So I think you'll, you'll see a little more variation to their kind of run pass cadence than what you've seen the last couple of weeks. I, I think you'll see Georgia look more like the offense they did for a lot of the year and, you talk about Georgia, I think a lot of people think defense because Kirby Smart's a defensive guy, and that's definitely the like identity of the team. But I would argue this is probably the best offense he's had, uh, Kirby Smart's had. Maybe maybe 2018 would, would kind of challenge that as well. But like they just tend to they, they tend to be more balanced, you know, and more effective. Like there's been times in the past where if you take Georgia's run game away, things get really sketchy and so far this year it, it hasn't happened much but when it has Stetson in that you know group of pass catchers has, has been fine and they'll just go throw for you know 300 350 on you and, and everything will work out so I'm curious to see sort of how LSU comes out early in this game if they do go heavy into the box and kind of creep those safeties up then then I think it's more likely to be like you said where Georgia you know, tries to tries to test them downfield a little bit more early and, and kind of back those guys off and create more room for that running game. I, 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 you're saying that about their offense. I do think there's a, a lot of merit to it in a sense of I don't think – I personally don't think their receivers are what they've kind of had there in the past. But I do think you, there's three tight ends that they could run out there that you would be hard-pressed to say <laughs> they're not running the ball and they all catch the ball just as well. Right, and so that alone right. kind of makes an offense very scary. Of how do you play them? Where do you play them? Do you play the run? Do you play the pass? I think that alone kind of puts a like the fear of God into a lot of coaches because you just don't know what they're gonna yeah, do. They're in a big formation, but they have three pass catchers that can go, and they're all the huge. They're all like really, really, really big. <clears throat> yeah, they all can block. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, as as much the talk as there is playing. about Brock Bowers. Yeah, I know. There's, there's. That's. I'll be interested to see how. The Eric Gilbert thing kind of developed. Us too. I think us, everyone. Us too. <laughs> us too. I swear to God. <laughs> us too. <laughs> that would be the ultimate trouble. Oh, man. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like, as good as Brock Bowers is and as much publicity as he gets, like, Darnell Washington, I think, is, is kind of the scarier of the two just because, like he's built like a slim offensive tackle. He's dominant as a run blocker. And then, hey, is his number you know, zero under, bigger than than it should be? Like, did they make it bigger <laughs> just so it could fit him? It looks huge. <laughs> <laughs> did they make it better, yeah, bigger it, so it could it, fit it, him? It's just yeah, it's just an intimidation thing, I guess. I don't know. I mean, you know, the dude wears a basketball jersey really instead of a football jersey. Um, but I mean, like you know, he, he all of a sudden gets the ball in his hand. They'll run like a lot of these little play action kind of boots with Bennett, and Washington will just kind of creep out in these little you know flat routes a few yards past the line. And if nobody's there, they flip it to him, and he gets into the open field and starts rolling, and it's Literally. it's problematic for Literally defense. Rolling. But um, but yeah, I mean, on the on the wide receivers, I would say I, I agree with you on the whole. Um, I think Lab McConkey's a little underrated just because he's he's not physically imposing, but uh, 
we've seen over the last couple of years, like Georgia run some of these heavy 12 personnel sets where they'll put those big tight ends out there and they'll put him alone out outside. And if you get him in one-on-one -on -one coverage and you get enough time from a pass protection standpoint for him to run a double move, like he has burnt some very good corners over the last two seasons. So that's kind of another element of this, even if the run game is working, like I, I don't know. I, I think Georgia will try not to make things quite as hard on themselves. And, and they, they have had a little bit of a, a difficult time in the red zone the last couple of weeks. So there may be a desire to, to try and score from far, especially early in this game, just to kind of assert, you know, a lead and, and set the tone a little bit. Like Georgia is a very game script focused team. Um, yeah, y'all are fucking And I guess loaded. what I mean by that is just like, well, yeah, but I mean, they, they just, <laughs> They really, I mean, yeah, it helps when you're very talented. You normally get a lead, right? But, like, if you kind of look at how Kirby wants to play a football game, it's it's very much as, as you described, right? Like, come out early, throw the ball around a little bit, and then in the second half I want to attempt, like, maybe six passes max and five of those in the third quarter. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. they just really, I think, <laughs> like to – you know, I mean, like that Kentucky game a couple weeks ago that was, I think it was nine to three at halftime or something like that. Like Georgia fans were, you know, freaking out on social media. And like my thought was like, no one loves a nine to three halftime game more than Kirby Smart. Like this, right. like he would do this every week if he could. <laughs> oh, and speaking of a conky, what's your comp for him <laughs> going to the NFL? I mean, I was going to say it, but <laughs> I'd like for him, Graham, to say it. Oh man! I mean, you know the the Hunter Renfro. There's a lot of Hunter Renfro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, you know. I mean, he honestly he's a little more agile than Renfro. Oh, um, Randall Cobb. It's weird y'all picked it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, there's a little like Wes Welker in him, just in terms of you know. I, I think he's a little better in the screen game. But he's than, bigger than, than Wes, Renfro right? Is. Not much. I mean, he's 5'10", so, you know, I guess Wilker was, what, like 5'8"? Is he that short? Yeah, yeah, probably. Julian Edelman. Yeah, but... I, he's six feet tall. I mean, there, like, there's a pounds. reason that... Wayne Corbett. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere in that mold. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason he's... he's Wayne was nice fun. back in the day. Vince Papali. Vince Papali, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Old. No, I mean, like, there's a reason he returns punts, though. And it's yeah. just that, like, yeah. he, Must be nice. He's really good at creating space in in tight quarters. Yeah. Um, and you know, I mean, like, I think a lot of people kind of underestimate the dude, but uh, there's been a lot of plays this season where he's kind of taken something and or taken nothing and turned it into something. Like, if if you get him in space, he can make guys miss. And I mean, dude, he put. Or like he made Oregon look silly at times uh, on a few occasions, like, and, and they will run in arounds and stuff with them. So they play defense there. It, yeah, no, they don't. Really. <laughs> <laughs> they, still, they still made him look silly. I'm like, kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, I'm I'm kidding. kidding. I mean, we know, yeah, first one in, last one out. You know, McConkey. But I do. If from an LSU perspective, what makes if you had to find a, an avenue for an upset on our end? What makes you nervous going up against an LSU team? Obviously a dud against A&M, but everything going into this game, it felt like it was going to be one for, at least on the LSU side, a chance to play for a playoff. Yeah. So they still are, a, I would say, a live dog. If you're a Georgia fan or if you cover Georgia, what makes you nervous about LSU? I mean, I think the defensive line in that group of pass rushers, including Perkins, obviously, uh, has been really good all year. And, like – you know, you you look at just sort of anatomy of upsets, and it, it usually happens at the line of scrimmage, right? For all the talk that you know we have about downfield matchups and all that, like if, if that defensive line can make things hard on Georgia running the football at times, and then you know get Georgia like the the book on Stetson throughout twenty twenty one, right? Was like get him in third and long, and he'll kind of melt down. He's been really good on, you know, third and six plus situations this year, like top five in the country good, but he hasn't faced a ton of them. Like George has been really great at staying on schedule. So uh, I, I think that's the thing, man, is, is like 
get them, you know, win on first down and and try and get Georgia into obvious passing situations with that defensive line. I think that's that's scary for any offense as as good as those pass rushers are. Um Graham, listen, I appreciate you coming on the show. I hope for our sake that uh, you know, because y'all are gonna be in the playoff anyway, so y'all don't need this. You know, we need this for the uh, longevity of our program. So, uh, I'm hurt, you know, dog. for our sake, I hope that we upset y'all for, you know, maybe just a good game we do at the end, maybe a little kick to win it or something crazy. Uh, but, man, I appreciate you coming on the show. And, uh, you know, I, you gave us more insight than we would know about Georgia. So I appreciate it, man, and uh, good luck this weekend. Absolutely. No, tons of fun. And uh, always – I've got good buddies that are, you know, from from Baton Rouge area. Always enjoy LSU fans. So hey, nice, uh, nice. hope to see you guys in Atlanta. Oh uh, yeah, we uh, we'll, well, hopefully we show up. I enjoy Athens a lot too. So maybe oh. uh, you know, this new whatever they do at the SEC. Hopefully LSU and Georgia play a lot more, so I can go and visit Athens. Yeah, it'd be nice to go to Baton Rouge once. No more doubt, than once a day no day. doubt, man. Uh, all right, enjoy the rest of the week, and um, you know, appreciate it again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. All right, man.